All right, it is recording. All right, I'd like to thank Master Gardeners for um, doing this in service with us with us today. We've got Don from Wyoming County, who is our mushroom guru. He's going to talk to us about home mushroom cultivation, and I'm going to turn it over to Don. All right, thanks, Jan. Um, I'll do a little more of an introduction. So I'm Don Gashevitz. I work in Wyoming County here, uh, do similar work to Jan, try to cover a, a number of other things, uh, tree fruit, berries, veg crops, uh, home gardening, things of that nature. Um, keeps me plenty busy. And then on the side, I, um, I so I cover mushrooms here as well and a little bit of agroforestry for cooperative extension. But on the side for a uh, home business, I have a, a business called Toad Song Mushrooms. It's a, just an outdoor mushroom farm. Uh, we're in Berriesburg, New York. I've been doing that since like 2011, 12. Um, didn't really get too serious ab about it until maybe 2014 or 15. Um, we started, uh, we mostly grow shiitake, but we do a number of other mushrooms on the side. So we'll go through um, a lot of the mushrooms uh, that you can grow at home. And, and we're gonna really focus as I get into the presentation on low tech. And, and that kind of lends itself better to outdoor mushroom production. Um, but we're gonna touch base on some of the little bit higher tech if you wanted that comparison on uh, doing some indoor growing and, and why there's some pluses and minuses to sort of both of those techniques. Um, and, and then we're gonna talk a bit about um, supplies and, and resources at the end. So one thing you're not gonna be after this presentation is an expert on, on growing mushrooms. There's a lot of process involved with each type of mushroom. I'm intending this to be sort of an introduction to each of those varieties of mushrooms that you can grow somewhat easily at home. And then you can choose to uh, pursue each one of those mushrooms because each one does have a very specific set of uh, cultivation techniques that you need to follow to be pretty successful. So we're going to kind of cover the basics, like I said, and um, we'll, we'll get you dialed in. And, um, you know, my contact information will be at the end too. So you can get a hold of me if there is any one mushroom that you really want to try to, to grow or if you want to try to grow a number of them. So this picture here on this first slide is just a, what I'd call a fall box. This was all mushrooms that, um, that I grow and this is just a fall harvest. So we have some lion's mane, some namiko, some comb tooth mushrooms, shiitake and some wine cap. So they're just uh, all happen to be overlapping and naturally fruit. Every one of these naturally fruited. Um, I didn't do anything to get this box of mushrooms here uh, to, to grow. So you can be very passive or you can be very active in your in your cultivation techniques and it's really sort of up to you and what mushrooms you want to grow. So jumping into it and just understanding what what is a mushroom. Um, it's the fleshy spore bearing fruiting body of a fungus uh, typically produced above ground on soil or on its food source. So it's important to remember that a mushroom is decomposing and consuming uh, the substrate that it lives within. So it's, it's always eating. It needs a very specific sort of um, uh, nutrient source in order to complete its life cycle. We'll, we'll talk about the life cycle next. And then it's also important to know that fungus is competing with each other for resources. So uh, you can't really plant two types of mushrooms in any one area because one will outcompete the other. Um, they may just spend most of their time in uh, vegetative growth competing for resources and never really gather enough resources to actually fruit and produce that, that mushroom. So if you think about it, the mushroom is sort of the apple of the apple tree. There's a lot going on uh, with the mushroom life cycle that, um, sorry, there's a little, little noise from above in this room. Um, hopefully that's not blocking me out. Uh, so it's always kind of what, what came first, the mushroom or the spore, it's sort of like the chicken and the, or the egg, but um, the mushroom, if we want to start there, um, it really, that's the fruiting body. So it's releasing spores. Those spores sort of meet up on a, on a nice growing substrate. So this mushroom here is, a, is an oyster mushroom. It prefers growing on, on rotting wood. So the spores get together, they, they form some hyphal knots. Um, and start getting together the, the reproduction portion of the mushroom. So they form mycelium. So just to give you an idea of what mycelium is, if you ever were in the woods and flipped over a log and you saw the like white strands, sometimes they're orange, yellow, those strands sort of running along the ground and, and on the bark of the tree, sometimes under the bark, um, 
you know, sometimes you'll peel bark off and see a crazy design that's usually formed by um, mycelium of, of a certain mushroom variety. Um, and then when that mycelium has uh, sort of, it releases enzymes and digests, as I mentioned earlier, what it's growing on, um, it gathers enough energy and then the environmental conditions such as the heat, the humidity, uh, so I shouldn't say heat, temperature, humidity, uh, moisture level, all sort of initiates the fruiting and the, the creation of the actual mush mushroom fruiting body once uh, those resources are, are uh, gathered in enough abundance. So a little bit on why we grow mushrooms, and, and I've taken a lot of these slides out of different presentations, so there'll be a little bit in here about forestry and, and making money and hobby. So, um, you know, there's a lot of reasons for mushrooms. Um, these were source of my, some of my reasons. Uh, it started as a hobby. I really liked just growing a garden. I really liked mushrooms. I started researching how you can grow mushrooms, and, uh, you know, I went with it um, for a few years. I just sort of monkeyed around with it and then got a little bit more serious. So um, I needed to clear wood in the wood in the forest for, uh, you know, around deer stands, along trails. Um, so all my, all my uh, substrate comes from, uh, you know, my immediate property and family owned property. Um, other people may want to just diversify, you know, uh, maybe they have a veg farm and want to provide mushrooms. Could be a great source of income, but, you know, Mostly it's a great hobby if you're growing outdoors. Um, you could go on further to make it into a business if you want. That's the, the path I chose. And mushrooms are definitely good for you. So there's a lot of, a lot of vitamin, vitamins, minerals, uh, beneficial things for you. A lot of protein in mushrooms, especially if you're a vegetarian. So as far as home mushroom production goes, I kind of give these, these little bit of pointers here. You want to focus on simplicity. Um, you want to be low tech. Um, start small. You can sort of build your, once you find a mushroom you're good at growing, you can uh, research a little bit more and, and build up a, a larger uh, area if you are going to do some indoor growing. Um, utilizing resources you already may have or can obtain pretty inexpensively and keep your mushroom operation close and, and near to a water source. So just to give you an idea, um, we have about a thousand to one thousand two hundred and fifty um, shiitake logs at any one time that are in production and um, if we didn't have water we really couldn't do much with those um, and and the amount that we pay to to keep that that business going and our initial investment is very very inexpensive maybe 250 300 a year utilizing you know a four-wheeler a tractor we already have and um, a chainsaw so the the supplies are relative you know most people have those things, not saying you do, but some have those around already. So use what you have, you know. Um, you can also find neighbors and things that might have the substrate that you're looking for. So a few terms uh, with mushroom production, and we've gone over some of these. So mycelium, that's the vegetative part of the fungus, and that's consisting of that fine white filaments. Um, so spawn is the vegetative mycelium and the fungal spores, they're cultured on sawdust or grain under sterile conditions. And these are what you purchase from a supplier. So um, I, I can't see myself here, but I'll hold this up. We'll talk about this at the end, but this is just a mushroom, just one of the mushroom supply companies. Just like you, you know, get things from a seed catalog, there's mushroom supply companies. Um, this is the company I happen to use. They have a great website. Everything's really user friendly, but you buy spawn from these companies. And that's, you know, one of the things you might need to buy. Well, you definitely have to buy. And then your tools, all of your tools for growing mushrooms come from these companies as well. So a lot of people try to create their own spawn. Um, that's, that's way past what we're trying to do. There's some major, major sanitation uh, involved in that. And the, like I said, the expense in buying sterile spawn that's ready to, to grow out and, and make more mushrooms on more substrate is, is so inexpensive. It's kind of crazy to get into, you know, it's a great hobby if you want to try, but starting to make your own spawn is a, a quite an endeavor. So inoculate, I think I probably had mentioned that, that's the act of introducing or planting mushrooms on its preferred substrate. So as I mentioned, everything has a preferred substrate. How you introduce that spawn that you buy to that substrate is the act of inoculating and it's different um, each type of mushroom that you're trying to grow. So whatever mushroom you're trying to grow, um, 
whether it's indoors or outdoors, um, these basic principles here, I'm not sure how many, maybe eight, all sort of apply. So before you decide whether you're gonna grow indoors or outdoors, um, you wanna decide the type of mushroom you wanna grow and the, the type of substrate that that mushroom prefers. A lot of time, the substrate that you may have readily available dictates the mushrooms you're growing. So like myself, I have family owned property. I'm always back there cutting wood. Um, you know, growing shiitake on logs is a, is a no brainer for me. But for me to go and purchase uh, straw and sterilize it, um, and pasteurize it and do all those sorts of things is sort of more, more involved than I wanna get. Um, it's, it's a little bit more work, but it can be done on a small scale and we'll, we'll go through that. Um, you purchase your spawn from the spawn supplier that I mentioned. Um, ensure that the substrate is prepared for inoculation. Um, and a lot of time that's pasteurization. Each, each substrate needs to be uh, treated a little bit differently um, for the mushroom you're trying to grow. You wanna inoculate that substrate and then you allow time for incubation and colonization. Um, and again, specific to the mushroom and the grow method. So not to make this seem really like on large scale, um, you know, there's one, there's mushrooms that are grown indoors that only incubate for three to four weeks. And there's mushrooms that will get into that, you know, need a year to 18 months, some even two years of incubation time and a spawn run for that uh, substrate to get completely uh, colonized with the, the actively growing mycelium. So um, if you're actively growing mushrooms, you can initiate a fruiting or you can passively grow mushrooms and just sort of um, wait for them to grow when the weather conditions are correct. We'll get into each one and each mushroom that you can grow and, and what they do better with. And then harvesting and enjoying your mushrooms. So we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, some indoor versus outdoor uh, cultivation pros and cons, and this isn't a complete list. I stole this from the Cornell Small Farms website, their mushroom cultivation website. Um, outdoor, at least, you know, that, that website, they're very focused on, uh, who, you know, can you make some money doing this rather than hobby? Um, this is meant for hobby. So all of these uh, species here that are on the outdoor list, you can readily grow outdoors. And some of these indoor mushrooms, uh, the only overlap the only one that's not really overlap is chestnut. You can grow that outdoors. It's starting to be supplied by uh, some of these spawn suppliers. So, you know, you can read through the pros and the cons. Um, obviously for me, some of the pros for growing shiitake outdoors were to utilize my woodlot resources. Um, very low capital investment and I wanted to support the forest um, and, and keep things under control. So it is a lot of labor. There's um, you know, a lot of heavy lifting involved. You've got to move the logs from the woods to where you're going to inoculate them. And then you have to put them in a, a area where they incubate, and then you have to sink them in water. So you're, you're moving the same logs as you'll, you'll see the process later, but you're moving those logs many, many times. Um, indoors, you can use, you know, racks and things, and, and you'll see pictures of that later. Uh, you can kind of do everything in a, a little bit easier manner, and you can get a little bit, um, you're not so dependent upon the weather as you would be with oyster, lion's mane, strafaria, mushrooms, and you can sort of, and you can take those indoor growing conditions and you can, you can sort of make them once you find an area you want to grow in. Um, and there's some really low tech ways to do that. So uh, you can grow many species indoors. Um, your yields are definitely larger um, compared to logs and you get year round production. So for me, I do the shiitake on logs. It works well for my farm. Um, they, they are very dependable outdoors, as it mentions here in the pros, and then I supplement with some of these other mushrooms. So when they are in season and when they're naturally fruiting, I've already developed that shiitake mushroom market, and I can add those other mushrooms into that. Whereas a homeowner who just, you know, loves all kinds of mushrooms really would just have to, you know, inoculate some substrate and really keep a good eye on it and you'll get mushrooms. You can be a little bit more active with it and get a little bit more mushrooms if you wanted to grow outdoors and do shiitake. Or if you wanted, say you really liked oyster, we'll go over some really low tech ways on easily growing oyster indoors where you don't have to invest in a lot of infrastructure up front. Um, you know, you really have to create some environmental conditions if you're growing indoor mushrooms on a large scale. So outdoors, you're, you're pretty much mimicking nature. Um, you know, those conditions are ideal. That's where mushrooms naturally grow. So some people sort of, 
view seasonal production as a, a con. I, I view it as a pro. It's a great way to make a little bit of money in the summer. I enjoy mushrooms that that I wouldn't normally have and would have to purchase. Um, and that, like I mentioned earlier, only that shiitake can be managed to have that uh, reliable harvest. Uh, after moving thousands of logs many times throughout the summer, it's kind of a pro when that season's over for me. I don't really want to continue, you know, indoors for the rest of the winter. My, my season's done. It's sort of like a vegetable farmer. But then again, the season's never really done. So this is the time of year where I'm harvesting logs. I think we're going to uh, inoculate about 450 new logs this year. So, um, you know, really the mushroom mushroom grower works from March, April, all the way until October. So indoors, uh, as I mentioned, it's pretty much controlled environment growing. Um, the species we can grow expands, um, but you have to start considering uh, that you have to monitor and maintain the environment. So you, you know, for various stages of production and uh, you wanna eliminate sources of contamination, all that stuff has to be taken into effect. When you're outdoors, there's really, um, the, the way you inoculate and, and grow your mushrooms, that stuff's far, far less of a concern. You're not dealing in, in tight spaces and areas where humidity, light, and, and things are changing, um, you know, on huge levels where, you know, outside it's 70, what, 70 degrees yesterday and tomorrow it's going to be in the 30s. So the, the substrate and the, the mycelium and the mushrooms are, are prepared for that and, and they are in tune with your environment, whereas indoors, you're really, really having to, to create that environment. And uh, we'll talk about some of those environments you need to create. Uh, and a plus, is, a plus to growing indoors is you can use really kind of low, low tech facilities. So um, many of the mushroom, I work pretty extensively with an indoor mushroom grower in Buffalo, and he's been in the basement of a factory uh, it was a little little dingy, a little hard to control the environment, and now he has moved to a more open air uh, above ground factory that he's finding to be quite a bit uh, more feasible for indoor mushroom growing. But you'll see some pictures here of some low tech indoor setups that I have done through extension that have been quite successful. So we're going to compare indoor and outdoor growing of all of these types of mushrooms. These are what I'd consider sort of the easy, most commonly grown mushrooms for sort of fresh eating and cooking. It's not, it's taking out of the equation, the uh, medicinal mushrooms and, and those sorts of things. In my opinion, many of those can be found uh, locally wild. I'm not gonna, I'm not condoning saying going out and, you know, going and getting those, but if you know what you're doing, they're, they're a lot easier to find than they are to grow. So starting with oyster mushrooms, um, these can be grown outdoor on logs, typically on totems. So what a totem is, is, uh, a, a larger diameter um, hunk of wood, typically two to three feet. Um, you can see pictures of them here. And they are um, inoculated just by cutting those um, logs into coins. And you, you uh, sort of put the spawn, which is really just sawdust with mycelium in it for the type of mushroom you're trying to grow. So some really do well with totems, oyster do. So you just layer that in the, in between the cookies and you stack them back up. And really that's as difficult as that needs to be to inoculate. So they work well outdoors, um, but they have some, some definite cons to growing outdoors. For me being <clears throat> somebody who markets them, uh, they're tough to grow outdoors on a totem. Um, because they have a lot of pest pressure. There's a, it might just be in my area, but there's a small fly, <clears throat> excuse me, that lays eggs in the mushroom. And those um, little larvae are present in the mushroom. So I have a little bit of OCD. I really like my, my mushrooms to be clean. So sometimes there's so many in abundance that I, I don't even really want to eat them myself. So I would, I would never sell them. So on the, on the picture on the right, you can see the totems. Ones on the left are, are Cornell, they're nice and pretty. Mine on the right here are um, a cooler weather oyster mushroom. And they are, I have it in like a pallet contraption that I stapled screen on, onto the outside to try to keep those little flies out. And they still got in, but not, not as bad. But the amount of work that was involved in that was just not worth it for me. So they're, they're just a tough one to grow outdoors very successfully. And then one thing I didn't mention is each type of mushroom. So I mentioned shiitake, I mentioned oyster. Um, 
there's different varieties um, within those um, within shiitake and oyster. So you can see easily here, there's a, these yellow mushrooms, these yellow oysters are more of a warm weather fruiter. They prefer, you know, 70 degrees somewhere in there where these cold weathers are a natural spring and fall fruiter. They're like a 55 to 65 degree fruiter. So again, your, your um, company you choose and your spawn supplier, all that stuff is, is sort of explained there. And I, if you're gonna get into mushroom growing, that's definitely the place to look for some good info. And then at the, again, at the end, we'll go over some resources and talking about how to find that really good information that explains the steps and, and how to grow these mushrooms. Um, so oyster mushrooms indoors can be really low tech, can be really high tech. So low tech on the left, um, that's an operation I had. That's literally a garbage shed with a steel storage rack inside it. Um, and on the right is, I'd say, moderate technology. They have, uh, you can see they have some environmental uh, steps involved here to, to kind of create the environment needed for those um, oyster mushrooms to grow. You can see they have the buckets with the holes. Um, they're going to probably use the spawn on the shelves to inoculate some, some straw. So some of the larger mushroom growers indoors are creating their own spawn at this point. So what they do is they, they buy a known bag of spawn and they grow it out into more bags and then <clears throat> take that further and, and grow their mushrooms out. So you can kind of replicate the mushroom over and over and over. So what I'm, and we'll get into spawn a little bit later. I probably should have introduced what the spawn looks like in the beginning, but it's, it really is, is what you use to inoculate and it can be grown out. So one five pound bag of spawn uh, using shiitake as an example, <clears throat> grows about, um, can be inoculated into 30, three, three to four foot logs. So you take something that costs $16 and you're putting it into those logs that can be fruited over and over and over again. So the, you know, the spawn is just sort of like your seed material. And you'll get an idea of that here. So um, I'm glad this has a picture of spawn. So on the table here is a picture of um, a grain spawn, the small plastic bag with the white label. <clears throat> <clears throat> so this is from a, um, a growing operation I did as part of a refugee uh, grant program. They wanted to uh, grow oyster mushrooms. So uh, it was part of our, our grant. So <clears throat> what we did to get started, we chose an oyster mushroom species that fruited in um, summer temperatures and we purchased grain spawn. Uh, as I mentioned, we chose straw as our substrate. As you know, I did some research, I found out that straw works very well for growing oyster mushrooms. And you know, you can't just throw it in the straw. You have to go a little bit further and figure out what the straw and how the straw needs to be treated and, and how it wants to grow. Um, <clears throat> what's sort of a, a preferred method. So um, we soaked the straw in 24 hours in water that was sprinkled with hydrated lime and the hydrated lime will give you a ratio. And some of your growing guides for oyster mushrooms will give you a ratio on how much lime to how much uh, soap water for um, you know, your, your starting pH. So um, that, that high pH water really will um, pasteurize that straw, make it so nothing else can really grow in it. All of the competitive fungus. So we allow the straw to drain and then we inoculate that straw with grain spawn. Um, and then we uh, stuff straw into the pre-made polypropylene bags or buckets. So I'll show you a picture of the of the buckets, but the, the polypropylene bag is just a sleeve of tubing that you buy. So it's, um, you know, probably 250, 300 feet and you, <clears throat> you sort of peel that off the roll and then you heat seal one end and leave the other end open. You have pre-punched -punch, pre holes in the bag, uh, 10 to 12 usually works, half inch to three eighths of an inch. And then you sort of mix your spawn with your straw and that ratio, again, is in your growing guide. Every time you order a mushroom, you get sort of a, a very specific growing guide. So I, you know, this is shiitake on logs. I don't know if you can see this, but um, this tells you everything you need to know on growing shiitake on logs, and you sort of just follow the recipe. Um, that's what we did with this uh, grain spawn that we purchased for these oyster mushrooms. So we incubated that three to four weeks. On the left here, going back a slide, that's how we incubated. Those doors on that shelf were closed. Um, you should probably have a little bit better airflow 
um, than, than we did there. But this was our first real try at some very, very low tech. These were people who wanted to grow them in their home and we were trying to replicate. So in a perfect world, you can grow this in like a dark closet with a fan, you know, with some air movement. Our, our main thing was we were trying to grow in an area where there was 24 hour light. So I had to exclude the light for the incubation. The uh, Once you introduce the light, as you can see kind of down toward the end here, that initiates the fruiting after the incubation. So after that, we harvest. So that entire process was, was five to six weeks. So here you can see another picture of just some, some really, really low tech oyster mushrooms. Up on the top left, that's that same sort of garbage shed or, or you know, uh, garden shed thing. And we just stuff the bags with the, the, the straw that's been inoculated with the um, grain spawn. And then we let it sit for th two, three, sometimes four weeks. You can tell when the bags turns completely white. The mycelium has ran through the straw, as you see on the bottom left. <clears throat> and then we pulled it out of the garbage shed. And the light. So that initiated the pinning. So you can see the small mushrooms starting to pin on that bag. And the top right photo is about a week later, um, the same bag. So you can see that I've actually turned it the other way, but there's the, the two middle sort of uh, mushrooms growing there and clumps of oyster and then the one at the bottom and some of the other bags are starting to pin. Uh, the ones on the far right, they just pinned a little bit later and the ones that you don't see. Some of them I had already <clears throat> picked the mushrooms off of as well. Uh, mushrooms do very well in buckets too. So if you didn't wanna do the whole propylene, polypropylene bag sleeve, you could literally grow them in flower pots. You can grow them in buckets. Um, people will stuff that inoculated straw into flower pots. They have the holes in the bottom. Maybe if you use like a half gallon or a quarter, like a quarter gallon pot and just stack them up and, and sort of leave them outdoors, you will eventually get mushrooms. You can be very, very passive with oyster mushrooms. Uh, we tried to do a little bit more control because we were trying to really <clears throat> up our production. So um, I've seen people where they've taken these, um, like the spent material. So what's in the bag and what's in the bucket and they sort of stick it in their garden bed and you'll start to get oyster mushrooms right out of that, you know, as it decomposes. One question a lot of people have is, um, can these be fruited one time or two times? So you can, you can take these bags and then you can, after you harvest the mushrooms, you can put them back into incubation uh, in the dark and then pull them back out after three or four weeks and initiate another fruiting. But a lot of the resources in the straw have been used up, so the mushrooms won't be as prolific. There won't be as many, they won't be as nice, but you, you can still get another crop. Um, they're best sort of used for a compost. And then, um, like I said, you can get some secondary mushrooms or even you know a third flush off of them. So a little bit on uh, so this is sort of shiitake and oyster indoors. So this is a typical indoor setup. So you could see here, um, this is in a fruiting room. So they, they have their, their bags of um, spawn right on these shelves. So what, what mushroom growers, a lot of them do is they just buy the bags of spawn from the mushroom supplier. And then they literally incubate them and then poke holes in them and provide the conditions that they need to fruit them. So that's another thing you could do at home is literally not grow the spawn out by putting it into straw or something else, another uh, substrate, depending on whatever type of mushroom it is, you can simply fruit. So these are what like sort of the easy grow mushroom kits are that you can buy online. I don't know if anyone's seen them. It's sort of like a cardboard box that you pop open. So you, you initiate light and then you start watering it and you can literally grow mushrooms in your living room if you wanted to. So this is how most indoor mushrooms are grown. I, I couldn't find a picture. This is from the guy I work with, uh, indoor grower. <clears throat> well, we market a lot of mushrooms together. He, um, this is his setup. So he moves those big racks from incubation down the hallway to his fruiting room. He does that with shiitake, all of the sorts of mushrooms that we're talking about today. So um, jumping into shiitake, to go back to, I guess, oyster, um, I didn't talk about, I did, I did talk about the incubation a little bit. It's three to four weeks. Um, and you want to do that at like uh, 65 to 75 degrees. So it's a pretty warm incubation temperature. Um, and then after that, moving it to the light, you're going to initiate that fruiting. So typically the temperature is a bit lower. Um, but again, with oyster, there's blue, white, yellow, pink, um, depending on that, 
that mushroom, um, there's different fruiting temperatures that they prefer. So they just create those conditions indoors for those. So with shiitake <clears throat> indoors, they're doing the same thing. They're buying these bags and they are fruiting them. Um, some do choose to grow them out. So the mushroom grower I work with is really starting to, he's buying um, a treated wood pellet um, that's prepared for special for special for mushroom growers. And he has a large room that he can put like eight or 10 of these racks in. So he sterilizes his own substrate that he buys. And then he uses a bag of spawn he, he buys, and then he grows it out into more bags. So it takes a little more time, a little more um, incubation, but you get more mushrooms in return. So you take, you know, one bag and turn it into an entire rack or an entire half rack of, of those bags by growing it out. <clears throat> um, and with shiitake, like with oyster, the incubation for shiitake mushroom, 65 to 75 degrees. So a lot, a lot of mushroom growers are, are really incubating in the same room and then just providing different growing conditions at, for their fruiting room. Um, as you'll see, all of the mushrooms really like that incubation at 65 to 75 degrees if you are growing indoors. Um, and it isn't that particular. So when to go back, like these were, I didn't monitor the temperature. I just wanted to see what would grow, spending the least amount of money and, and absolutely no environmental manipulation um, other than finding a decent spot I thought would work. So, you know, very, very low tech to very high tech here. Just a comparison. So outdoor shiitake on logs. Um, so these are cut, grown on fresh cut hardwood logs. And we're gonna go through this process quite a bit because this is sort of the most bang for your buck for the home grower. If you really wanna grow a good amount of mushrooms at home, I'd highly suggest or recommend growing some shiitake on logs. Um, typically you have a, a tree in your backyard you can use or a neighbor does. Um, there, there's, a, there's a bit to it. We'll go through the process. So just to start <clears throat> with some of the basics, Oak, maple, and beech are sort of the preferred trees. Um, I don't have oak. I have quite a bit of maple and quite a bit of beech. I'm not going to go out and buy oak. They say it's a little bit better, but I have really good luck with my maple and beech. So um, you can see the mushrooms on these logs, and these are a little bit older logs already, too, and there's still quite a bit of mushrooms on them. Um, you inoculate the mush these logs one time. So people always ask, like, well, after they fruit, you inoculate them again. Nope, you inoculate one time. Um, they incubate for 12 to 18 months after incubation, and we'll, we'll do some pictures of this so you, you can picture a lot of it. And then these logs can be fruited after that, <clears throat> after that one year incubation period or 18 months. Most, most are ready to go in a year to 13 months. Um, so you soak that mushroom, that log in water for cold water for 24 hours, and your mushrooms are ready in seven to 10 days after you pull it out of that water. Um, and then you put that, that log back to rest and then you can get mushrooms again on that log by soaking it. So you just wanna keep this in the shade and out of wind. So here's sort of the inoculation technique. Um, you've got to, you have to drill holes. Um, you can use either plugs or um, a sawdust spawn. Uh, each has a tools that you know, are used for that. We'll, we'll show a picture of that in a little more detail. Um, and then you wax the holes to kind of seal the moisture in so that, that that sawdust spawn or your plug spawn can spread out from your inoculation point. It's sort of an epicenter and the whole log will become colonized. So everyone asks, well, the mushrooms are just going to grow out of those holes. Not really. They're going to start at those holes maybe the first year. But as you go longer and longer, they start to, that's sort of the epicenter. They start popping out all over the bark of the log. So you can see in this picture, they're not you, my, the dark patches are sort of the inoculation points, but there's mushrooms sort of everywhere, not just at those points. So when you drill your holes, you know, this is sort of a recommendation. If you're doing a lot, I say, you know, I don't really pay too much attention if they're in a diamond pattern on like a, a the size of your log is about three to eight inches in diameter. An eight inch log can be pretty big. They're about three foot long. Some are four foot long, depending on the, if they're, if they're smaller in diameter, I usually make them a little bit longer. And then if they're, they're larger in diameter, obviously I don't want to be lifting those heavy logs many times. So I just, if it's a, you know, four to five rows down the face of the log as you, as you rotate it. So sometimes I just do like a cross pattern. 
so here's sort of the, the method in pictures for outdoor shiitake. Um, I, I do the method on the left, it's the angle grinder and it uses that bit in the middle. So the angle grinder is very, very fast and that bit has a stop on it. And that directly corresponds with your inoculation tool. I don't know if you can see this, but uh, this comes from the mushroom supplier as well. This is literally just a, a hand operated piston, very easy to use. After you drill the hole, um, there, the hole is left that, that corresponds with this piston. So this puts a perfect size dose of the spawn into the, you kind of stab that into the bag of sawdust uh, that has mycelium in it for the type of mushroom you want to grow. And then you, you put that into the, into the log. Um, then if you're using like a dowel spawn, um, so here's, here's what I'm sort of talking about. I didn't realize I had this slide. On the left, they're using the thumb style piston inoculator to put the, you can see the little brown sawdust there into the hole. Um, in the bucket is the, the spawn. They just emptied it out of the bag. You tap that into the bucket, fill up your piston, uh, the, the void that's in there, and then the plunger pushes it down into the hole. It fills the hole, you know, right to the brim. Then you seal that with wax. On the bottom is uh, when I first got started, that was using plug spawn. So if you're just doing a few logs, plug spawn would be the way to go. You just need a, a, a drill bit that corresponds with that size uh, dowel that you buy, and then you can inoculate the log uh, that way. I find the sawdust spawn is a much bigger dose, a lot quicker. Um, and if you're going to be doing it on any larger scale, it's sort of the way to go. The dowel spawn is pretty expensive as well, but the pros to it are, are great if you're just doing a few logs. You know, you don't have to invest in tools and, and all of those things. And, and you wax the plug spawn as same as you do the, the uh, sawdust spawn. Um, and then here's just sort of a low tech setup. This is all I really use. Um, I, I spill things a lot, so this is kind of a nightmare for me. Um, there's usually doing a lot of logs. So I use like an electric frying pan and it's kind of anchored down. I strap it down with a bungee cord and then I can, um, you know, keep it right in, in the electric frying pan. There's some deep sides on it rather than things that can tip over and spill. And you just paint that over the, over the inoculation point once your spawn is in the hole. So after you've inoculated, you have that waiting period. This is the 12 months. This is you put the shiitake logs in the woods. Um, this might seem a bit excessive. Um, this is when I first got started, maybe 500 logs or so. Um, just hanging out, ready, ready to be fruited. I would take a stack of mushrooms or two stacks of mushrooms at any one given time and put it into the barrels. You can see the stock tank sort of in the middle ground there. And then they come out of the stock tank and they grow on the grow rack. You could see there's some small, not the best picture, but you can see there's some small mushrooms starting to be produced on those logs. Um, and then the rotation just continues. We'll talk about the rotation in a minute. But you know, don't, don't let this uh, turn you off like you have to have this many logs. Like if you had one log, you can soak it every seven to eight weeks. If you had 10 logs, you can soak a log or two every every week. Um, and that's sort of what I do just on a larger scale. So in, in a perfect world, if you had eight logs, you could have mushrooms every, you could have shiitake mushrooms every week of the summer, fresh. So step five is soaking for 24 hours. Um, I, you could soak in a pond. I don't know how you would get those logs out of that pond. Um, I do the stock tank similar on the right and, you know, a lot, lot easier. I'd rather soak uh, over the course of two days, if I didn't have enough space in a stock tank, then to try to rescue those logs out of that out of that pond, um, I use cold well water. So I have a, you know, X, that really shocks the log and makes it produce the the mushrooms. And again, in there for 24 hours and then out, and then seven to 10 days later, this is the result of those soaked logs. And in theory, you just have a constant rotation going. So there's some, some perfectly ready shiitake. They're ready when the cap's still curled under a little bit, just as the veil opens. So uh, those are sort of pick, pickable and ready for market. And sometimes in the summer, like if it's really hot, um, I use a wide range strain. So it goes anywhere from 55, maybe to 75, 80 degrees. It's really conducive to our weather. I'd recommend that if you are gonna get started with shiitake. Um, they, they do well with the forest fruiting, which is soaking in the water. And when it's really warm out in the summer, like sometimes five days, you'll have your mushrooms completely ready. It's not unheard of. So after they come up, 
after they are fruited, you've cut your fruit off, they go back to rest for six to eight weeks, somewhere in that. I like to rest mine about eight. You get a little bit bigger, bigger flush. Sometimes I even wait like 10 just because I have so many logs. And the older they get, I like to let them rest a little bit longer. They, they'll get more mushrooms on them later after they've gathered a little bit more energy. Then they can be soaked again. So any given mushroom can, any given mushroom log for shiitake can be soaked, um, you know, two to three times a summer, depending on if it started toward the beginning of summer or toward, or toward the end when you, if it was the first of your seven weeks or the last, that kind of dictates if it's soaked through two or three times. So here's just sort of a demonstration uh, visually of your seven, if you have, you know, seven stacks of logs or seven logs, you can soak one log or one stack per week and have a harvest every single week. And then you just start at the beginning again. So if you have, you know, 210 logs, you divide them into seven, you've got 30 logs per stack, you're, you're growing 15, 20 pounds of mushrooms a week. That's not too, too difficult. So I was about to say any questions, but we'll sort of hold them to the, to the end. I'm sure there's tons of questions on a lot of that. Um, so we'll jump right into indoor lion's mane, and then we'll talk about outdoor lion's mane. Indoor lion's mane mushrooms, super, super uh, similar to how you did the uh, oyster and the shiitake. The indoor guys are buying bags, growing them out, uh, incubating them, moving them to a fruiting area, and you know doing, doing that method. Um, they just do that over and over and over again, and they constantly have mushrooms. Um, once you initiate that fruiting, um, maybe a week or two later, you have your, your mushrooms ready to harvest. They typically do one-time use with these bags and then, um, and then ditch them and recycle them or compost them. Uh, some sell them to, for uh, soil substrate for growing for gardens. It's a great compost for your garden. But there's a lot of, a lot of plastic, a lot of environmental manipulation. Um, once you get that set, you know, then, and you're growing out your own bags, that becomes cheaper and cheaper per bag. So you're <clears throat> a lot of, a lot of inputs to growing indoors, whereas outdoors it's, you know, cutting the log, inoculating it, letting it sit and you, water is really your, your difficult portion of that. It, to go back a little bit to shiitake, if you were to just let your shiitake sit in these stacks, they will fruit but they won't fruit as drastically as this picture. You'll get sporadic mushrooms here or there when there's enough rain. Um, you could probably hose that big stack down, you know, over the course of a couple of days and get a few more, but they really do best with um, soaking. You could passively grow them and just, you know, try to battle the slugs and the, and the weather for them. Um, Going back to this picture, this growing rack worked well for me, but if it started pouring in the middle of the night, I had to come up and cover that um, I didn't want my mushrooms getting wet. They just turned into a giant sponge. The closer they are to getting to being ready, the more spongy they will be. <clears throat> so now there's a large canopy in the woods there. And I just fruit all my, I think I have eight of those racks. Everything's fruited underneath those now. And I don't have to worry about the weather. So, you know, this, this has the potential to get, it looks like they may have some tarp in the background that they stretch over that or a fruiting blanket. They do sell those. Um, you want to keep those mushrooms dry. So when you are, you know, passively growing, you are battling insects, time, weather. There, there's a lot of that to be considered. Um, hey, Don, it is 12.45. You wanted a time check. Gotcha. Perfect. Yep. We're, we'll smoke through some of these. So outdoor lion's mane grows just like the oyster that I had shown before. And I say comb tooth as well. That's a, just another herisium um, species of mushroom. So you can see them in the picture here. Uh, the, the lion's mane is the tighter ball type of white mushroom and the comb tooth is some of the more open sort of snowflake looking or uh, many small uh, white puffs as opposed to those larger one in the middle there. But they, they grow the same way. These can actually be found quite, quite readily um, outdoors in the fall. Uh, no real poisonous lookalikes. Um, don't go eat white mushrooms because I told you to. Um, but, you know, if you wanted to study them, they can be found. Um, but they're very easy to grow. They have a little bit of a longer spawn run of one to two years. Um, I have had them fruit. I was plant them in the fall, inoculate, and they'll fruit the same, or sorry, plant them in the spring, inoculate in the spring, and they will um, fruit that same fall. So don't be scared to, to you know, not get started with those. Beach is a, is a, I'm always cutting down beach, so they work great for this. Um, I just add these in when I'm selling other mushrooms. So these are a great 
low tech home, you really don't even have to buy any tools. You just buy a bag of spawn, cut down um, your totems and, and you grow them. The flavor is pretty delicate, sort of like um, mushroom mixed with like a seafood. Um, and the bugs don't really bother these too much. So um, they can get rained on, they don't get too spongy. So they're, they're a great one to grow. Uh, indoor chestnut mushrooms, again, doing the same thing, growing the bags out. Um, if you wanted to grow these at home indoors, you'd probably buy a startup kit or buy the bag spawn, um, open it up and or and or inoculate it further into more bags and um, just keep growing them out. But the, the shipping on this stuff is expensive. These mushroom growers, I really don't know how they do it when they buy these bags, how they make it feasible with all of the, the energy inputs along with the cost of shipping. Each one of those bags is probably about five, six pounds. So the shipping costs are insane with that. So if they can get a setup together where they can um, pasteurize their own substrate and grow those, those initial blocks they buy out, they're, they're doing far better than just buying the blocks. But again, it, a lot of um, veg growers who are getting into mushrooms simply buy some of those small blocks or some of these blocks and fruit them. Uh, and then they don't really have to spend a lot of time growing mushrooms indoors. So these fruit in real high volume, they're, they're a great mushroom. They're that like quintessential mushroom flavor, real, real bold. Like, so they're great with steak and they're great with um, eggs and things like that. Uh, grown on a supplemented sawdust wood pellet. So they typically will, will uh, supplement with some uh, you know, sort of like a fertilizer, probably a source of nitrogen just to help, help things grow a little bit better. So I'm gonna try these this year. I bought two bags of spawn. Um, that's enough to do about 60 logs, 50 to 60 logs. Uh, they're a natural fruiter outdoors. So we're gonna see how they do. Um, I hope they do great because I love them when I buy them from uh, the guy I know who grows mushrooms. It's uh, flat 12 mushrooms in Buffalo to give him, him some credit. All of these pictures I'm using are from him. Um, but I usually get my, my mushrooms there. If you want to try some of these mushrooms before you uh, eat them, you can usually find some of these ones we're talking about at Wegmans. Uh, Tops is starting to get some of those. So, you know, make sure you like them before you grow them. Some people just want to grow them as a hobby though, which is completely fine. Uh, they like 40 to 65 degrees in the fall, natural fruiter. These don't, so the totems I showed you and these, um, uh, chestnut mushrooms and the ones in the future, they don't lend themselves well to the forcing. You can't soak it in water and then get your mushrooms a week later like you can very easily with the shiitake. They like maple to grow on too. So nice one to try. I can't wait to see what they do. I only have a year to wait. <laughs> um, actually about a year and a half So because they don't fruit till the fall. So Namiko mushrooms, I grow these at home. Um, they're not a beginning, beginner mushroom. They're easily confused with some others. Um, but if you know what you're looking for, they're not too bad. Um, inoculate them the same method as shiitake. That's the same for the chestnut as well. So once you have the tools, you just need the spawn to do namiko and chestnut. Um, they're a natural fall fruiter. Um, they have this slimy gelatinous coating though when it's wet. Um, some people are turned off to that. That's actually uh, uh, desired in some Asian cuisine. Um, a lot of that, the mushroom as well as some of that, um, that sort of viscous uh, layer adds some savory flavor and thickening to soups and stews and things like that. One thing I meant, I didn't mention the um, chestnut and the namiko are sort of perennial. They'll just grow when they want to grow as does your, you know, your bulbs in your garden. When the weather conditions are right, you'll have your mushrooms. And if you don't catch it in time, the bugs and the slugs will, will have your mushrooms. So I recommend in the beginning, keeping this close to home where there's some water, you can keep an eye on things. Wine cat mushrooms, they're an excellent beginner mushroom. So I grow these underneath my asparagus. You can see the asparagus ferns. Um, these are great. You just kind of do these in the lasagna sort of technique. They grow on wood chips. I recommend using wood chips that have been aged a year or two. Um, hardwood, you don't really want to use pine. Um, you can mix a little pine in there. So what I did to plant these was I had just asparagus growing. Um, and then I put a layer of sawdust or sorry, a layer of straw down. Uh, seedless straw, so some chopped straw. Then I um, added my spawn, my bag of uh, strafaria or wine cap spawn, and then I sort of covered it with wood chips, um, multiple different types of wood chips. A lot of that are my wood chip fillings from drilling my shiitake logs. And then um, I, I just swept them up, poured them on top, 
and, and that bed was inoculated and they grow in the summer when the conditions are right. These are nice for the garden and, and sort of garden paths. They grow in the sun. They don't mind a little bit of sun. So um, they, they're just a really prolific fruiter. Um, if you don't catch them, they get a little bit of, they get bugs in them as well. But these were caught right at a perfect time. Um, you know, you want to pick them. Th those are perfectly ripe. I'd even pick them when the caps are still a little closed. They have a little bit more flavor. So I'd, I'd rather go for quality than quantity. So they're a good mushroom. And they're perennial and you can just keep feeding them wood chips. You can also move these around. So if you just grabbed a big clump of that, that uh, inoculated um, substrate after you probably have, you know, it's been in there a while and you can see these, I don't know if you can see all the white strands all over that, that's the mycelium. So if you see that, you can spread that around. So I typically will grow like fill five gallon pails of this and sort of dump it here and there and just have, you know, mushrooms growing all over. So harvesting and storing mushrooms, you know, as with anything else, you want to cut or twist them. Um, you know, scissors are usually safer than a knife. Mushrooms don't lend themselves well to freezing, so dehydrating is pretty good. Um, sun dried or a dehydrator works great. Um, if you want to keep them in the fridge, loose, loosely closed paper bag is the best. They last in there for a couple weeks. Um, you know, commercial people will typically keep them in boxes and wax line boxes. You don't want to put mushrooms in anything plastic. The, the humidity in there sort of makes them rot pretty quick. Uh, you can also cook them into dishes and freeze. Um, and I think I kind of covered this. I think it's sort of a duplicate of that slide. So really importantly, resources um, and sourcing spawn and supplies. So I'll, I'll jump into, um, share my screen for a website that I recommend. So this is the Cornell website that I had recommended. Can you guys see that? Yes, we can, Don. Perfect. So this is Cornell Small Farms. So everything I talked about and some of the information I mentioned came right from this website. This is everything you need to know. It's a super easy website to navigate. So any growing mushrooms indoors, outdoors, why we grow them can be found down here. I start down here at the bottom. So if you're interested in outdoor production, just as an example, we can jump into this website and go into outdoor production. You know, the mushrooms that do well, um, sort of all the, the history, um, a lot of this is focused on, you know, the economics of it, but the principles are the same for growing one log as, as growing 200. So um, there's great videos on how to inoculate, um, great fact sheets. You can see people doing this. There's um, fact sheets on your oyster, your oyster and lion's mane mushrooms on the totems. You can, you can easily come in there and do that. Your wine caps on your wood chip beds all the directions are here. And as I mentioned, if you order these from your spawn supplier, um, you know, the direction sheet comes right with them, with your spawn, um, sort of all the, all the stuff we had chatted about. Um, and then one other thing that I wanted to show you last thing here that was, is helpful for just getting started is the, um, let's see here, finding supplies. So finding your mushroom supplies, whether you need to find spawn, there's the whole directory of where you can get it from. I like to use field and forest products. It's just the one I've, I really like their educational materials. When you leave through their catalog, it tells you exactly how to grow everything. A lot of other places just assume you know what you're doing. And, and I don't really like that. I, you know, I, I have to start from scratch myself. So, um, you know, take advantage of these resources and, and go off of some of the stuff that, um, has already been created for you. And then people who sell logs, there's a whole network of logs if you did wanna grow and don't have access to them. So I think that's all I really had. Um, oh, there was one other thing I was thinking of. So there is some events and online courses. We have one coming up here, uh, shiitake inoculation and sort of the same crash course we just did um, coming up in late May, or sorry, late April, I'll get Jan the date and she can sort of send that out to you. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. As far as what I wanted to show you guys, I'll, I'll kind of open it up to some questions. Yeah, that's great, Don. I think it's fascinating how you can just grow them in a raised bed type situation for that one type. Yep. Um, nobody put any questions in the chat and there's only eight of us on. So I'm going to open it up. If anybody has questions, you can unmute yourself or um, raise your hand and 
Yeah, and I'll, I'll put my, can you see my contact info there? I don't know if that's good. Um, You're still on the small farms page. All right, cool. I'll get rid of that. And then if you have oh. any questions, you can just contact me too, if you don't. Yeah. Ray, did you have a question? Yeah, will wine caps grow under an apple tree where you mulch with wood chips? Yep, I don't see why not. You know, I, I would certainly prepare a bed. I wouldn't, um, you know, just hope for the best with what's there. Um, you know, if there's already wood chips there, I would set down a layer of straw and then I would sprinkle some um, mycelium, some spawn on there and then cover with some fresh wood chips. Okay. But, but you, you know, you, you might have success. I'd say try it. It's relatively inexpensive to get into and, and go from there. Anything grow on ash logs? Nope, nothing grows on ash logs. I, I wish it did. I have a lot of dying ash. So <laughs> if you ever noticed an ash log in the woods, it's usually never really inf uh, infested with any sort of uh, mushroom on it. It will get like turkey tail, which is a, a medicinal, but it doesn't get, you know, some of these, you know, robust sort of eating mushrooms. It's got something in it. I think it, I think what happens is it dries out too quickly into firewood instead of where these others will sort of maintain a lot of their moisture content. Other questions for Don? I thought there'd be tons. <laughs> They're all debating whether or not they want to grow mushrooms. Sandy, you have to unmute. So hopefully you can see that too. There's just my contact info, but it's kind of notes yep. version. Um, yep, we can see that. Um, Sandy, did you have a question? Do you have to constantly um, Resoak after you the mushrooms come up. Are you, you have to do you have to constantly when you put it outside constantly soak the wood. Uh, nope. So so after you inoculate. So um, if it's like a super dry summer, I may water them once or twice. But okay. I actually never I've never really watered the logs. There, okay. you, there's enough sort of reserve moisture if you're worried about it you know putting a sprinkler on them or something like that they typically get enough moisture from the rain if it is really really dry though you some it sometimes makes me a little nervous but they so you do you grow you grow you. them you grow them under trees more yep. like there's less light yep so i grow them under an evergreen canopy you know shady is good um i have grown under a deciduous canopy it seems to work just fine. You know, mostly, most of the time we don't have a ton of sun, but this year it's been, there's been quite a bit of sun. So wind also will dry out your logs. The only thing that'll really kill a log is too dry or too wet. So you want to keep it out of the wind and keep those logs, you know, in sort of a sheltered area. Um, some people do, so I sell logs. Sometimes people have pretty good success just on the north side of a barn or a house. You know, it stays cooler it stays a little moister in those areas most of the time. The snow builds up there. Um, you know, it, it's a good spot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so you don't, get, you, don't get, you don't get other mushrooms once it's inoculated because the mycelia goes through the wood or so, through the so that's why you, you don't get other mushrooms in there. Yep. So it's so a lot. That's why you cut down a fresh alive log because there's nothing okay. else. As I mentioned, they're they're competing. So if you cut down a fresh live, say sugar maple log and you inoculate it with shiitake, really the only thing you're gonna get out of that is shiitake. There is potential. I don't wanna say you're never gonna get anything, right. but if you did, um, that's why I, you know, I mentioned the website, go to that and become sort of, if you, if you know you wanna grow shiitake on logs, you can become an expert on that. Like um, they have a guide to growing shiitake in the Northeast. It will show you the actual other mushrooms that will show up. None of them look anything like a shiitake. They're sort of more, um, you know, bulgur is what, what the one is called. It's just a, a brown, looks like almost like a scab. So there's nothing that really looks looks like anything you shouldn't be eating. Well, how about the ones that you put in the sawdust and stuff on the ground? There, there's always the, always the potential. So you really have to be yeah. pretty sure, okay. that, you know. They, so those guides I mentioned on that website will really talk about, you know, being careful of lookalikes. As with anything, there's risk, but it's <clears throat> nothing should look the same. So if you, you plant a tomato and it looks like a bean, you know, you don't you don't eat it. Um, you know, that's same with mushrooms. If it's not yeah. what you're immediately looking for, there's ways to do spore prints and things. But um, you just just being really familiar with what you're growing and, and sort of 
providing the right resources sort of make it so you're, you're quite a bit more successful and don't have those competitive fungus to deal with. So do you do it for, you do it at your house for profit. Um, do you have to go quite a, a distance to sell your product? Um, I do. I, I drive to Buffalo, but I, I did. So I sort of tried the farmer's market thing in the beginning and I tried, you know, retail marketing. There's a lot more time in that, a lot more money in that. Um, I tried going to restaurants. That was a, a lesson in frustration. So I wasn't interested in putting, um, you know, mushrooms in little quarts and pints and, and taking them around and, and selling them and spending my time doing that. So I got to a point where I made the connections of selling wholesale. So I sell about 40, anywhere from 30 to 50, sometimes 60 pounds per week wholesale. All at one time, I take one trip. It's all sold ahead of time. So, you know, they're, they're expecting those mushrooms. When I did restaurants, it was, I'd show up with the 10 pounds. They said they'd take a week of the five pounds and they say, well, we didn't use as many from last week. We only want two. Well, now I've driven to Buffalo and, you know, two restaurants have told me they want a quarter of what I brought. What do I do with these other mushrooms? So there was a lot of frustration and a lot of learning. And, you know, I sell for a cheaper price, but if I had to chase accounts around and, and things like that, I would never even make close to that amount of money. So I, if somebody was going to do it commercially, I'd say to diversify. So I do still visit farmer's markets once in a while. Um, I, I try to provide some education with it. It makes it a little more attractive. And then I go back and forth with my indoor mushroom grower. So he sells my stuff. I sell his stuff. So I don't have, you know, one type of mushroom. No, the okay. part is growing shiitake. You're just selling shiitake. So if you have other stuff, it's quite a bit of, of more appealing. And I do sell uh, mushrooms on, on like farm stands that just have vegetable crops. They're usually readily willing to accept other things to kind of get people to stop at their stands. So I found that to be pretty successful. That's really how I got started was asking friends and neighbors who had farm stands and, and they said yes and people wanted them, so. Well, maybe you could just have a mushroom day a month and just tell people, <laughs> advertise it to come. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I wish I could grow enough. You know, it's, it's turned into a pretty good business. I, I always wanted to just have a stand in front of my house where I sold retail mushrooms, but everything just goes when I grow it. So I haven't even gotten to that point. So I'm at the point of almost needing an employee. So it, it snowballed and uh, it's, it's, good, it's good money and it's, it's fun to do. So it's better than just hanging out watching TV in the evenings in the summer. So, and, and the amount of work, it's maybe 10, 10 hours a week to sell 40, 50 pounds of mushrooms. But I, I did a lot of work to set up the grow area for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Other questions for, for Don? Thank you, Don. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for listening. Yeah, I'd encourage you to try any and all of them and, you know, try to have a, a bunch of fun with it. There's, you can do it on a very, very small scale. That's how I got started. So it's a lot of fun. Yeah, this is great. So um, for everybody who's on, we did record it. It'll probably be next week before I get it up on YouTube, but I'll also share um, Don's upcoming class that he's got with the group then. So if there's no more questions, then thanks everybody for attending today. And thank you, Don. This was really yeah, interesting. Yeah. All right, I'm going to end the recording.